Hi, I'm Tom Long. If you've been watching these island meditations for a while, welcome back. And if you're new, we're glad you're here with us today. Now, this week we're going to be looking at the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 14 through 20. And um, unfortunately, it's a little windy out here uh, in the Carolinas uh, this weekend. And uh, that's going to prevent us from being able to record the audio uh, outside. So uh, just indulge me as we uh, instead kind of bring everything uh, indoors, if you will. And for those of you that have experienced much worse weather than what we're experiencing here, um, just know that uh, our prayers have been with you through the week. And, you know, we've seen the snow falling, we've seen the, seen the floods, and uh, we're very aware of that, uh, how fortunate we are here in the Carolinas at this moment in time. So it, it continues to amaze me every week as I go through the uh, four readings for the lectionary for the coming Sunday. Um, it seems like there's something that I never noticed before or that just hits me in a fresh or different uh, perspective than what it had in the in the past and that happened to me this week the uh, very first words of our um, pericope uh, are after John was put in prison <laughs> and so I, I had never really connected that phrase with the rest of the reading and and that phrase ties us back to the very beginning of chapter 1 in Mark's Gospel where he tells us about how all the crowds were coming out from Jerusalem and the hill country to hear John the Baptist preaching about how the people of Israel needed to repent and be baptized to prepare the way for the coming Messiah. And then Jesus comes along and gets baptized by John the Baptist. And John the Baptist says, okay, everybody, here he is. Next, what happens? Jesus goes out into the wilderness where he's tempted for 40 days and 40 nights by the devil himself. Next, what happens is today's reading. So now we're learning that John the Baptist, who really got the ball rolling to prepare people for the coming of Jesus, uh, John the Baptist is now in prison. So what have we seen? We've seen that the powers of darkness and the secular powers of the establishment have both come out to fight against the arrival of the Messiah. But is Jesus discouraged by that? Absolutely not, because we're told that his response to all of this is to go into Galilee, one of the most cosmopolitan areas that he could go, and begin proclaiming the good news of God. So what exactly does he mean, does Mark mean when he says that Jesus is proclaiming the, the good news of God? I mean, imagine if a friend came running into the room and said, I've got good news, I've got good news. What do you think he would say? I'd probably say, okay, spit it out. What is it? And Mark doesn't leave us hanging because he tells us how Jesus defines the good news in the very next verse. All right, before we look at what the good news is, uh, I want to digress a little bit. Some of you may not be aware that in, in addition to my divinity degree, I also have a degree in machine design engineering. And when I was reading the rest of this passage, it brought to mind uh, turbochargers on a car, or actually it could be on any engine. Uh, but anyway, it, that's what it brought into my mind. Now, uh, my wife and I both had, per the last cars that we purchased, we purchased the last model year. The new ones were coming out and we knew they were no longer going to make the vehicles that we bought with V6 engines. You were going to get four cylinder engines that were turbocharged. That is the direction 
that technology is moving. So the car manufacturers are all switching to fewer cylinders and then turbocharging them so that you get the same uh, power and torque as you did out of the more, uh, you know, the six and the eight cylinder vehicles. And how does that work? Well, a turbocharger uh, is a, basically an air compressor and the energy to spin the air compressor comes off of the exhaust gases from the vehicle itself and then it compresses the air that goes into the cylinder and mixes with the fuel the gasoline or the diesel fuel and when and, and by compressing the air there's more oxygen in the same volume of air that's in the piston and so more of the fuel gets burnt and converted into energy and it becomes more fuel efficient. So in a normally aspirated car, the, not all of the fuel burns and a lot of it just goes out the exhaust and is wasted. So you have low, less fuel economy and you also get less power out of that stroke of the piston. Now, you're, <laughs> you're probably thinking, this does not, how does this relate to, to what the Bible is saying? Mark told us that Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. And now he's going to tell us what that good news is in Jesus' own words. Jesus begins by saying, the time has come. And what that means is the time of waiting is now over. So for hundreds and hundreds of years, probably a couple of thousand of years, the prophets had been foretelling the coming of the Messiah. And the people of Israel had been looking forward to that. They were in a country that had been conquered and was being dominated by the Roman Empire, and their own people were being led, organized by Leaders, leadership that was collaborating with the Roman occupiers. And so that was the situation they were in. And what they wanted desperately was for a Messiah to come and to deliver them. And in their minds, deliverance meant deliverance from this Roman empire. And Jesus is saying, okay, the time for Messiah to come has come. And unfortunately, <laughs> In English, it doesn't quite carry with it all of the information that there is in the original Greek because the way that that verb has come uh, is stated in the Greek, it means not only that it came, so, you know, the Messiah is here. Jesus is the Messiah. The Messiah is here, just like John the Baptist said. But it also means that the way that that verb is stated in the Greek, it also means that it's continuing to have effect at the present moment. And so the kingdom of God has come means that it started with Jesus and it continues to the present moment to be impacting people. And so the, the kingdom of God has come near. It's close to you, it's present with you. The kingdom of God is a huge topic, and we're certainly not going to be able to do an exhaustive treatment of the kingdom of God uh, at this moment. But if you break it into its simplest terms, the kingdom is that group of people that are ruled by the king. In this case, the king being God himself. And so the kingdom of God is those people, made up of those people, that are following God as king. Now, I'm gonna go a little theological nerd here on you. Um, and in theology, we tend to think of God's will in three different categories. There is the decorative will, uh, as in the, the will of his decrees, which is if God wants a mountain to collapse, it'll collapse. If God wants the seas to dry up, they dry up, and so on. So that, that's the will of his decrees. And then there is God's permissive will. And God's permissive will is, uh, an example of that is that 
we, although we are all made in God's image, we also have chosen to do things that God, that displease our maker. And God permits that to happen. He permits us to make those choices and have those consequences. That's the permissive will of God. And then finally, you have the prescriptive will of God, which is what God wants us to do, what he's prescribing for us to do. And so the doctor, uh, you know, can send a prescription to your pharmacist and uh, it's up to you. <laughs> Are you going to go to the pharmacist and pick up the prescription? But the prescription is there. And the prescription is God's revealed word in the Bible. It may be uh, a word of prophecy from one of God's prophets to God's people. It may be the prompting of the Spirit of God within us, telling us what it is that God wants us as individuals to be doing. And in this particular uh, situation where we're talking about the kingdom of God, what we're talking about is that group of people in whom there is obedience to that prescriptive will of God, respons responsive to what it is that God wants us to be doing. Now, I'm not saying that before Jesus came, those three categories of God's will didn't exist, that he didn't decree something to happen, that he didn't permit things to happen, and that he didn't prescribe certain behaviors from his people. But what I am saying is that when Jesus came, it was like the car manufacturer adding the turbocharger to the engine. You're created in God's image. You have something of the beauty, of the, of the morality, of the goodness of God built into you. It's stamped into you. But by his per permissive will, we can choose and do choose to do things that are displeasing to God and aren't good for us or our fellow human beings. Now, when I say that uh, the coming of the Christ is like a turbocharger, the reason I say that uh, might be more clear if we go back to talking about what is the meaning of the word for spirit in the New Testament. And the word for spirit is pneuma, like in pneumatic tires, you know, tires that are filled with air. And uh, so the word for spirit can also mean breath. It can also mean wind, for example. And so when Jesus opened the way for the Holy Spirit to come into those that would seek to obey God, then we basically became turbocharged. Now we have God's Spirit working in us so that we can do more in the direction of expressing being God's image, being beautiful as a person, being good as a person, being kind and generous and merciful and just, all of those aspects of being more like the one who made us. And so as the Holy Spirit works in us, it's sort of like that turbocharging. It's we, be, we are able to better access who it was that we were meant to be, just like the turbocharger makes the engine better able to burn the fuel that it was already being given. And so that's good news, <laughs> isn't it? That we now have a way to substantially conform ourselves to the will of God. Now, I just want to just interject here real quickly that the Bible also makes clear that we never get perfect at this until we see Jesus face to face when he comes another time or when we go to heaven to be with him. So we're moving in that direction and we have that spirit moving us in that direction, but we don't get there until we get there and we're not there yet.
or you wouldn't be listening <laughs> to this video. So after Jesus tells us that the good news, you know, the, the good news, the kingdom of God is at hand, it's near, then he goes on and gives us a bit more of that uh, God's prescriptive will, telling us what it is that God wants us to do. And he tells us to repent and believe the good news. Now, when I was a teenager, I worked at a horse farm and then later as, as a racehorse groom. And part of my job uh, in both of those instances was cleaning out the stalls of the horses. Uh, because you, you know, you can't train a horse to use kitty litter or to go outside to go to the bathroom or whatever. The stalls need to be cleaned out. I had the wonderful job of being, being the one with the pitchfork and cleaning out those stalls. And now, uh, when we got done cleaning out the stall and throwing all of that waste into a big basket, I would carry that basket out and dump it into a manure pile. So imagine if I was carrying that big basket of waste out of the barn and my boss pulls up in a truck with a load of hay on it and says, Tom, you need to take this hay into the barn and put it away so I can take my truck and get back out in the field and get more of what's being harvested. What would I have to do? Well, I'd have to take that big basket of manure, that stinky, smelly waste, and I'd have to set it down. And then I would have to go with my hands now freed, pick up the bales of hay, carry them into the barn and put them where they could become useful uh, to feed the horses, right? Well, when Jesus tells us to repent, that's what he's telling us to do. Stop going in the direction that you're going. Stop carrying all of that manure, all of that waste, all of that stinky stuff that is in your life. Set it down. Pick up the life that I've given you and turn around and walk in a new direction, as we'll see in a minute, a direction in which we're just following him. So when he says, repent and believe the good news, that's what Jesus is talking about. Now, we don't repent. We're not going to turn around. We're not going to go in a new direction. We're not going to change anything unless we believe. We have to believe that the, the kingdom of God is at hand and that that is a good thing. It's a desirable thing. So that's why he's inviting us to believe. And then finally, as we come to the second part of our reading, there's an addendum for those that do repent and believe. In the later verses in our, in our passage, Jesus says to these fishermen that have become his, that are going to become his apostles, he says to them, come, follow me, and I will send you out to be fishers of people. So, as we were talking about in, in uh, a minute ago, when you repent, you're walking in a new direction. You're following Jesus. And as you follow Jesus, he begins to form you into something new. He, as his Holy Spirit comes into your life and begins to change you, God uses that in order to attract other people to come and follow Jesus, to repent and believe the good news that God has, has done and is doing a great thing. So I guess my question for us is, where, do we, where are we in that story? Have you believed the good news? Have you repented and decided to follow after Jesus? Yes and yes? Then it's time to become a fisher of people and invite them 
to follow after Jesus, to repent and to believe the good news. How different would our world be if more people <laughs> were concerned with creating beauty, with acting and governing justly, and showing deeds of mercy and kindness for people in need? How different would the world be? How different could it be? That's our job. We're called to follow after Jesus. And that's good news, not just for the people that follow Jesus, but for all of the people whose lives are impacted around us in a positive way. So, if you've repented and believed, if you're following Jesus, then come on, let's go fishing.